Hi everybody, now I'm going to read chapter 11 of The Fields of Home. Now, so this is especially for, well it's for anybody that wants to listen, but it's especially for Susanna, Katie, their families, and uh, Britt and Cora over in the country of China, and well, let's see, Gary and Ingrid up in Jackman, and Matthew up there, and anybody else who's interested. Chapter 11 is, is entitled, The Horse Fought Disaster. For anybody who doesn't know, the horse fork is a tool in, put in bands, oh, many, a oh, hundred years ago, or more, more than a hundred years ago, to haul hay up out of a hay rack and over, and then they dump it down in the hay mill. So, I might have to put my glasses on to read this. The second day of hay hauling didn't go as well as the first. It was hot. There was a little breeze in the orchard, but the barn was stifling. It took twice as long to pitch a roll off and stow it in the mouths as it took to pitch it on in the field. I bet it did. We'd have to stop and rest three or four times during each unloading. Every one of us would be wringing wet by the time we reached the bottom of the rack. Grandfather grew more crotchety as the forenoon went on. During the first unloading, he called down to me only two or three times about pitching either too fast or too slow. By our third load, just before dinner time, he wouldn't let me alone five minutes at a stretch. If I happened to get hold of a big forkful, he'd yell at me to stop trying to show off before I broke every fork handle on the place. If the forkful was small, he'd scold me for dawdling. Grandfather would neither rate scatterings nor build load in the field. During each loading, he'd come to the field two or three times, stay about ten minutes and go away. Each time he came, he'd take Uncle Levi's fork, pitch hay as fast as he could swing it, and scold me for being too slow. I didn't say anything back when he scolded. I tried not to change my pace. But before he'd leave the field, I'd be so furious that every muscle would be quivering. Millie didn't help with the last unloading of the forenoon that went to the house to get dinner. When we went in to eat, there was only fried salt pork, boiled potatoes, and johnny cake. Uncle Levi looked at the table looked the table over when he sat down and said to Millie, If you told me this morning you was out of meat, I'd have killed a hen while Ralph was doing the chores. Ain't nothing the matter with salt pork, grandfather snapped at him. Had a plenty of it when she was a boy to home, didn't you? Never heard tell of nobody starving once they had salt pork to eat, did you? Eggs is 18 cents a dozen, and the hens is all laying. Uncle Levi didn't answer. He ate only one small potato and a couple of slices of pork. No one said another word till the meal was finished. It was the first dinner since Uncle Levi had been there that the red rooster hadn't flown up onto the windowsill behind him and tucked tucked for something to eat. As Uncle Levi pulled, pushed his chair back from the table, he grumbled, even a cussed rooster knows better than to come to a dinner of salt pork and hay in time. Then, as we were leaving the kitchen, he turned to Grandfather and said sharply, How do you expect Ralph to hold a pace you're trying to set him with nothing but salt pork in his belly? Grandfather fled right back at him. But I didn't want to be there when they were wrangling, so I went to the barn and hitched up the horses. The afternoon was hot and muggy. Millie and Uncle Levi tried to get Grandfather to slow down a little in his pitching, but they only made him worse. Each time he came to the field, he'd grab the fork out of Uncle Levi's hands, race into the pitching, and yell at me for being shiftless and lazy. At the starting of the second load, Grandfather made me so mad I didn't care if he did kill himself. I wasn't going to hold a steady pace any longer and let him keep yelling at me for dawdling. I shoved my fork deep into the shocks, pitched as hard as I could. The faster I worked, the louder Grandfather yelled at me, till Uncle Levi called, Thomas, it's a God's wonder you ain't drove the boy away already. Grandfather was winded. His voice was squeaky when he yelled back. Mary sent him down here for me to make a man out of him, and by thunder I calculate on doing it. Then he tore into the pitching again. Instead of taking each shot clean, he'd grab a fork full off the top, heave it onto the rack, and shout, Get up! at the horses. Had to go just as fast as he or be left behind. Then I jabbed my fork too deep into a big shock, 
sprung the handle of Wuhad, and broke it. Grandfather was beside the yellow colt when I broke the fork handle. He jumped up and down and shouted so loud he set the old horse dancing and shaking his head. Then the colt braced his feet and went into a bark. I leaned on my fork handle, waited, waited while Grandfather yelled, Get up! Get up! Get up! You tunnel fool horse! He grabbed a bridle, weight, bridle, bridle rein, tugged on it, and shouted into the yellow colt's face, Get up! Get up! You worthless, good-for-nothing crow bait! Get up, I tell you! Then I did the most foolish thing I could have done. I stepped over and said, If you let me quiet him down a bit, I think I can make him stop bucking. Grandfather yanked his hat off, threw it on the ground, and shouted, Tunnel fool boy, never in all my born days seen such an all-fired know-it-all boy. Stand out of the way, I tell you. What do you think you could do to stop a horse of bucking? Wire his ears together, I said, and I said it quietly. Wire his ears together, Grandfather stormed. Don't you never let me catch you wiring a critter's ears together. I was mad enough that I had to be careful not to shout back, but I kept my voice down and said, All right, I won't. What do you want me to do now? Do, do, start fetching hay to the rack. What in time and tarnation you calculated on doing? Time flies, I tell you. Levi, give Ralphie a hand fetching hay whilst I go to the band for another fork. Millie, go get your vittles ready. Tunnel Colts like does not bought till sundown. When Grandfather was nearly to the van, Uncle Levi stood his fork down and said, Don't let Thomas rile you no more than you can help, Ralph. When he's tired, his nerves are jangled, he ain't accountable for what he says. Don't mean a cussed thing by it. Something I can't revel out is tormenting him bad. I'm sorry I broke another fork handle, I said. I've been trying to pitch as well as I could. Ain't nothing the matter with your pitching, Uncle Levi told me. It's good, and Thomas knows it. I'd give a cookie to know what's eating him. Calculate you could get that cussed yellow colt to stop barking? Now, without doing something to make him forget he is barking, I said, I think I'd have to put a wire on his ears. Don't calculate Thomas could catch us at this distance from the van, Uncle Levi said and winked at me. Seems to me I've seen a piece of wire hanging on the colt's harness. Uncle Levi pitched hay just the way I like to, steady but not rushing. Within a few minutes, after I put the wire on the yellow colt's ears, he forgot his barking and went back to work. I had taken off the wire. We had the rack piled high when Grandfather came back to the field. Neither of us saw him coming until, right from behind us, he sang out, Now you see, Ralphie, what your old grandpa tell you? Can't nobody do nothing with the yellow colt except to leave him be till he makes up his own mind. <laughs> Ruin him for all his lifetime if ever you'd go put him wire on his ears. Levi, you climb up and build a load whilst I and Ralphie pitches to you. For the rest of the loading, Grandfather pitched without rushing. At, at the unloading, I heard him wrangle with Uncle Levi several times. They only scolded me once, and that was for pitching too fast. When we were finished, and he came down from the mow, he was so tired his feet dragged. Uncle Levi stayed at the band to help me unharness and feed the horses. He grumbled to, him, grumbled to himself most of the time. I could see he was as tired as Grandfather. I told him so and said I'd take care of the horses, but he almost snapped at me. Taint the work, taint the work. There's times Thomas wears me thin in a cobweb. Oughtn't to quarrel with him. He ain't well, but by hubs this time he riles me. I think he was sorry as soon as he said it. While I was hanging up old Nell's harness, he stood with both hands crammed deep in his overalls pockets and said, Man shouldn't be trying to work in the field at Thomas's age. Leastwise, not a man that's got the malaria. Them of us that's never had it don't know how cussed cantankerous it can make a man feel. Grandfather sounded plenty cantankerous when he shouted from the house, What in thunderation are you dawdling around at now? Vittles is getting cold. The only difference between supper and dinner was that Millie had baked a couple of apple pies. Uncle Vitt Levi didn't say a word when he looked at the table over, but went up to his room. He was gone two or three minutes, and when he came down, he was sort of tasting his tongue. He passed Millie the bottle, partly full of whiskey, and said, Here, I calculate Thomas better have an appetizer before he tackles this kind of vittles. Grandfather said he wasn't sick and he wasn't tired, and he wouldn't touch a drop of the hot toddy Millie bought him. He did, though. Then he ate a pretty good supper and went to bed. I was just leaving the barn to get the cows. 
when I heard a squawking at the hen house. I thought it might be a fox or a skunk that was after the hens. So I grabbed a stick and raced back through the barnyard. As I rounded the corner of the barn, Uncle Levi was going toward the chopping block with a Rhode Island red hen in each hand. Uncle Levi had gone to bed by the time I brought the cows in from the pasture. The kitchen was dark when I finished my chores. The only lighted lamp was out in the summer kitchen where Millie was picking the hens. I turned the bushel basket over, sat on it, and began helping her pick. Neither of us said anything for several minutes. Then Millie asked, Who learned you to pitch hay and drive horses? My father, I told her. It was several more minutes before she said, Proud of your pitching, ain't you? Neither proud nor ashamed, I said. I didn't look up until I noticed that Millie had stopped picking. When I did, she was looking straight into my eyes, and if her face showed any expression, I couldn't see it. You're good for a boy, and you know it, and Thomas knows it. Don't rub it in. I'm not, I told her. You was this afternoon, she said. Only for a few minutes after you called me lazy. Know why he done it? To get every ounce of work out of me that he could. Grow up, she said, without any change in her voice. I don't know what you're driving at, I said. You will, time you're his age, have to watch a young boy best you in the face of your own folks. What am I supposed to do, I asked. Let him beat me and then call me lazy and shiftless? Till he calculates you think he's got you bested. Names don't hurt nobody. Thomas ain't going to let on his, to himself and nobody else. He's bested till he drops dead. You want to kill him? Let him row at you for a few minutes. I'll wager it to not be more than a few times. I looked back at the hen and picked a few feathers. After I'd had a couple of minutes to think, I asked, Where did you learn to make such good apple pies? Millie began to pick feathers again. All she said was, I got two oranges saved up from them Levi fetched. Want one before you go to bed? When Millie called me the next morning, there was a pink glow in the eastern sky. By the time I'd finished milking, it looked as if the woods beyond Hall's Hill were afire. There's a Hall Hill here in Brooks. Remember, Bert? Hens were oiling their feathers in the dooryard, and swallows skimmed low across the uncut fields, hay fields. At breakfast, Grandfather snapped at me, Eat your vittles, Ralphie. Get the horses out quick as ever you can. There's a tunnel hard rain coming, and five loads of hay still in the field. With the rain coming, I expected Grandfather to be awfully hard to get along with, but he wasn't. It worked just the way Millie had told me it would. I tried to act as if I were doing my best, but took two pitches for each shot till Grandfather was well ahead of me. Now that I understood, it was sort of fun to watch him tear into the pitching hear him yell at me to stop dawdling and pitch a man fashion. Within 20 minutes, he stopped rushing and pitched steadily a good part of the forenoon. Whenever he got tired, Millie or Uncle Levi found something to do away from the hayfield. We had a light, light shower just before noon, but the sun came out bright and the tops of the shocks were dry by the time we'd finished eating. Millie had a good dinner. She had stewed the hens with carrots and potatoes. Whoa! and the top of the bowl was covered with dumplings. We were right in the middle of eating when the old red rooster flew up onto the windowsill and tuck, tuck, tuck. Uncle Levi wouldn't give him any chicken. He said it'd be a sin to make a cannibal out of him, but he did feed him nearly a whole dumpling. The rain held off till the sun had dipped down behind the pines on the ridge. The last load was so high I could hardly reach the top with a long-handled fork. There were just two sharks left in the field when the sky seemed to open and the rain came down in torrents. Before we got to the barn, we were drenched. It was nearly dark when I finished my chores and took the milk to the house. It was raining steadily, but Grandfather was doing something at the beehives. Uncle Levi had to go down and argue with him before he'd come to the house. He would neither go to bed nor put on the dry clothes Millie had laid out for him, but sat shivering in front of the kitchen stove for more than an hour. He was sure the rain was going to last for several days, was fretting about its holding up the haying. Twice he asked Uncle Levi how many days were left before the 4th of July. The next morning it was still raining. The sky was like a gray bowl turned down on the saucer over the valley, or the saucer of the valley. Grandfather had chills and fever, 
so he had to stay in bed. But Uncle Levi and I hauled the old mowing machine into the carriage house and went to work on it. The wheels were the only thing about it that weren't completely wore out, worn out. <laughs> We'd never had a forge on our ranch in Colorado, and I didn't know much about blacksmithing, but Uncle Levi did. He never hurried. He didn't care how long a job took. But when he'd finished with it, every cog and bearing fitted perfectly. Besides that, he liked to show me how to do things, and I liked to have him. We spent all day, and until late in the evening, on the mower, regrinding gears, refitting bearings, sharpening knives, and replacing broken ones, solar welding the pitman head, and making a new tongue of dry white oak. While we were working, I asked Uncle Levi why Grandfather didn't have horse fork in the barn for unloading hay. For the past two days, I had been figuring out the different places a pulley could be hung from the rafters, so the horse fork would drop the hay onto any mow in the barn without a bit of pitching. Uncle Levi listened till I told him just how a horse fork would work. Then he shook his head a little and said, You'd have a cussed big battle with Thomas. You're always telling about how your father done things. Always trying to do like he done, ain't you? I didn't know just what he was getting at, but nodded and said yes, because he always knew the best way to do things. That's the ticket, Uncle Levi said. That's what Thomas thinks, too. Father learned him to find the way he done it himself. You'll find Thomas is pretty good at it. He ain't never changed when he could help it, and I don't calculate that he ever will. I was just thinking, I said, with a platform rack and a horse fork, Two men could have put that hay up in a day and a half. It took four of us two days and a half. Uncle Levi didn't look up from his welding for at least ten minutes. Then he stopped hammering and said, Never before she seen Thomas want to get away from the old place. But it's summer. He's got his hat set on going to his regiment's reunion off to Gettysburg. Comes on the 4th of July. But he won't go less than the hay's all in the barn. I've read in books they did have an army reunion at Gettysburg around 1912. This must be the one he's talking about. Might happen Thomas would stand for one of them cussed machines if it was the only thing that would get the hay in before the 4th. Well, it's the only thing that would do it unless we have two or three more men, I said. Besides, it isn't really a machine. It's just a big grapple fork with ropes and pulleys. Uncle Levi went back to the forge. In a few minutes, he said, Calculate we could whack one together out of heavy steel strap. There's plenty of pulleys around here. How big a hank of rope you figure we need? The next few days the weather was fine, but Grandfather wasn't. His chosen fever were worse instead of better. He had to stay in bed. That was when I found why Millie slept in the parlor. She'd get up four or five times during the night to take care of him. She gave him, in teaspoonfuls, nearly a third of Uncle Levi's bottle of whiskey. The mowing machine worked almost like new after we'd fixed it. Uncle Levi kept working around the carriage house while I was mowing the east field. He kept the forge going most of the day, and the ring of his hammer would follow me way out across the field. By night, he had most of the parts for the grapple fork shaped, ready to be riveted together. I finished mowing in the middle of the second afternoon. Then Uncle Levi hit old Nell to the spring wagon and drove down to Lisbon Falls. While he was gone, I'd figured out just where to hang the high pulley in the barn and bought a hole for it in the ridge pole. When he came home, he had steak, oranges, baker's bread, a piece of corned beef the size of a dishpan, and a big coil of heavy rope. Before I went out to AK the next morning, we strung up the tackle for the horse fork in the barn. Uncle Levi stood in the center of the fort, watched me climb to the peak of the barn. When I'd hooked the pulley block to a crevice, I lifted it to the ridge pole, pushed the clever spin through the hole I'd bored. You sure that's going to be stout enough, Ralph? He called up to me. Hole looks pretty nigh the bottom edge of the beam. There'll be a powerful strain on it. Sure, I told him. It's higher into the wood than it probably looks from down there. Just so as you're sure, he called back. Don't want nothing to go wrong with a cussed thing. It won't, I told him, and wrapped my legs tight around the new rope and went sliding down to the band floor. Grandfather wasn't re really wasn't well enough to be up, but when we were ready to haul hay from the east field, he wouldn't stay in bed any longer. I put all the low ropes and pulleys for the horse fork into one of the side mouths so he wouldn't notice them if he went to the barn. We hadn't even told Millie about the big fork. 
Everything went fine in the loading. For half a dozen shocks, Grandfather pitched as fast as he could go. Then he ran out of breath, passed Uncle Levi his fork, and went to look at the bees. When Millie and I drove the first load into the barn, Grandfather came from the beehives and climbed to the low mow above the tie-up. He didn't notice the pulley ropes till I picked up one of the blocks, slid to the van full with it, and called to Millie to follow me. The pulley whined against the wagon tire as I turned to catch it over the forehook. The noise set Grandfather off like a charge of dynamite. What in time and tarnation, he yelled. Then he saw the long rope dangling from the ridge pole, and Uncle Levi's horse walk hanging in the space between the two high mows. I heard his pitchfork slam down to the bare boards of the low mow. He shouted, What kind of fiddly dee falderell's going on here? Get that tunnel contraption out of here. Get it out, I tell you, before it falls on somebody's head. Levi, what in thunder you been sneaking into this barn while I been sick? Get it out. Get it out, I tell you. When Grandfather stopped for breath, it was easy to see that Uncle Levi had expected just what was happening. He squatted down on the edge of the high mow and talked to Grandfather like a mother talking to a little boy who doesn't want to go to bed. He kept telling him over and over the horse fork was only so he could have to, wouldn't have to break his back pitching hay all the rest of his life so we could get the haying done in time for him to go to the reunion. Every minute or two, Grandfather would shout, Lazy man's contraption! But each time he said it, a little more of the fire went out of his voice. In the end, he let us try it. But he wouldn't let me hitch old Nell out on the tote rope. The other colt didn't like the whiffle tree dangling on his heels. I had to tie his blinders together before he'd stop rearing and kicking. The last thing I did before I climbed up to set the fork was tell Millie to lead him real slow and to stop quick if I shouted. Except for the yellow colts jerking and jumping, everything p went pretty well with the first forkful. There was about 300 pounds on it. Uncle Levi yanked the tip line just at the right second to toss the hay clear to the back of the high mow. Grandfather was still grumbling. Lazy man's contraption, after the first load went up. After the third one, he climbed the ladder to the high mow stood watching like a little boy at a circus. By fire, I heard him sing out when Uncle Levi jerked the trip line on the next load. Everything would have been all right if it hadn't been for the yellow coat and the way the hay rack was built. I had bounced my whole weight on the fort to get it through the matted hay in the bottom of the load, and I bounced a little too hard. The yellow coat started off as if a firecracker had exploded behind him. When he'd taken up the slack in the tote rope, the whole rack jumped a foot into the air and crashed back onto the wheels. In a second, I knew I'd pushed the fork too far and hooked the grapples under the floor of the hay rack. But instead ah. of stopping, what? Under the hay rack. Yeah, it had poles oh, across. For, yeah, it had poles. There was space, and the tines went down. When he I know. The, so oh, the my hay God. Racks didn't go up. Oh, my word. <laughs> instead of stopping, when I yelled, whoa, the yellow colt lunged hard into the collar. There was a ripping screech from the top of the barn. I looked up just in time to see a big piece of rich ball come shooting down past Grandfather's head and missed him by about six inches. There's a picture of that happening. What do you bet his grandfather isn't very happy about that, huh? Grandfather wrapped his arms over the top of his head, crouched on the edge of the high mow. as a strip of rich ball shot into the barn floor and stood quivering. Ropes were still trailing behind it. When he slammed his hat down on the mouth, jumped on it, <laughs> and shouted at Uncle Levi, Get out of here! Get out of here before you save the whole place to smithereens! Get back to Boston before I lose my temper! Don't you never come down here again and no more of your infernal contraptions! I tried to tell Grandfather it was all my fault, but he wouldn't listen to me. He wouldn't listen to a word from Uncle Levi either. I followed him to the band door, shouting, don't you dare come sneaking around here with your newfangled contraptions. Get out of here. Get out of here, I tell you. I drove Uncle Levi down to Lisbon Falls. He wouldn't even let me tell him how sorry I was that I messed everything up. He only grumbled. Say nothing, say nothing, when I tried to talk to him. Once, he said, and I think it was to himself, should have known better. In no sense of trying to change him over. The rest of the time, he just sat there looking like a tired old bear. He didn't say anything more till the train was pulling into the depot. Then he picked up his suitcase, took hold of my shoulder tight, and said, 
Don't let Thomas, don't let Thomas kill himself off of working just to prove we was wrong. He had one foot up on the car step when he turned back, passed me a ring with four keys on it, and said, Here, Ralph, you might have need of them. Them to the drawers in the workbench. Then his voice al dropped almost to a whisper. The bottle's under my mattress. She Thomas gets a spoonful before supper every night. That's the end of that chapter. Wow, I guess it was a disaster, huh? Whoa. Well, that's the end of that chapter. See you later, folks. Bye.